Kia ora, and welcome back to Wellywood Wargaming. Mm. No, that doesn't sound right. So, about a week and a half ago, I recorded a an Orlock review. House of Iron, um, as is the current book for Orlocks. And Gang Guide, and decided it was absolute rubbish, so didn't release it and decided to record it again. So I recorded it again, and as I get home to edit it, what do I see but Wellywood Wargaming's review of the Orlock Gang. And I went and had a pint, was raging, and then I decided to watch it. And it was a really good guide. So I had to think, what could I do? Hmm. Is it'll maybe show me up if I release my guide. So what I'm going to do is reply to Wellywood Wargaming's video. I'll try and link it if I have the technical know-how around the screen, or if not below. Uh, and it's worth checking out. His channel in general is great for Necromunda content. And yeah, I'm going to do a reply and maybe stick my review at the end of this, which you can see in by clicking the tabs, uh, which will jump to my review. So going through the video, I actually would think we agree on the majority of things that Damon says about the Orlock Gang. What is worth saying that me and my group play like 50-50 ZM and Sector Mechanicus. So I don't know what Damon's playing, but like, or what split, because that will change with the power level of things. Like, it, just off the top of my head, one of the things that he mentions is demo charges not being the best. Now, that is not what I found. <laughs> um, but yeah, so it does come with the disclaimer that that is, and that's probably why it's worth having multiple guides. Um, so yeah, let's get into this. So, how to play Orlocks? How do they play? Um, definitely agree with him that Orlocks are a mid close range gank. Uh, but I would say that they more focused on shooting. Damon argues that they can do both shooting and combat. And I just don't think Orlocks have the damage output in combat that some of the other gangs do, especially if they've been buffed in how the house of books. Don't think you've got the the damage output to be a true combat monster gang. And in a game where there are these true combat monster gangs, you're going to get squashed, I think. <laughs> so how do you do combat in Orlocks? I think you have a couple of weapons on a few fighters and don't expect to massively dominate combat. It's just more there for putting the boot in, I think, when you're facing a shooting gang that won't be able to do much about your combat. But as soon as you start coming up against even mid-level combat gangs, uh, like even a Goliath that's gone, <laughs> that's gone shooting, you're going to have a bad day. Like that's definitely somewhere where you've uh, french fried when you should have pizza. So, um, I also don't think they're a great gang for beginners. So... There is the argument that they are good all-rounders. Um, as I say, I don't think they're as combat as as Damon thinks, but they are the all-rounder gang in that they've got no... They've not got a laser-focused point on combat or shooting. Not like Vansar or Goliath or Corpse Grinders do. I think that can actually be quite punishing for a new player. If you've not got a clear game plan at the outset, I actually think that's punishing for the player rather than, or like for a new player at least, rather than easier. Because you are going to be behind in at least one aspect of the gang and not dominating in the other aspect. You're only just better in combat than a Vansar. You're only just better in shooting than a Goliath. But obviously you, you are that slight bit better, but I do think it's it's not a good 
beginner gang. So why do I think that comes up through the stat lines and choices of in that you get in the characters? So we'll go through that. I do recommend watching Damon's bit going through. He goes through all the stats and I'm just going to do a reply, as I've said. And at the back end of this video, there might be my guide. The rogue captain, I don't think he's a great close combat character. I think the comparison that Damon makes between the Escher leader and the Orlock leader in that the Escher leader has three attacks, the Orlock leader has three wounds and two attacks. I think that actually demonstrates why it's like close combat, all about getting in and just one bombing someone. Like, it's, or at least what I found in my campaign, we get our campaigns, you get these combats that are incredibly snappy. And I think that's throughout all the game. Is they like, if you get the drop on someone, 80% of the time, 70% of the time, you were the one on the top of that. So regardless if I've got three wounds, a two damage weapon, and you've got like Escher leader, three attacks, charging, two close combat weapons, you've got five attacks on the charge. So if they're hitting on twos, that's five, 4.5 hits. And then if they've got a, a toxin weapon, well, I'm only toughness three, so you're wounded on threes. So that's like three wounds done. And that's just a quick example. If they had a better weapon than that, that's even more. So that's why I don't think they're a great close combat character. What I do think is that they were a good short range shooting character. So I actually really like the combi grenade. Look, I like something movable on my leader so that you can get about the place. Uh, I don't. I think the heavy weapons are best on a champion. Do I think putting a close combat weapon on my leader as a backup is good? Yes, but I'd stick to later in a campaign for that. I wouldn't do it in a skirmish. Uh, and like, like, oh, skirmish I might do because it's not like locked in then. But yeah, it's, so I, I think combi grenade launcher, combi melters are great because with the snappiness of Necromunda, yes, I'm going out of action quite easily on that six, um, which Damon alludes to because of the six up for the frag grenade, combi grenade launcher. But I can always just fire that other one. So it gives that safety net that is there to shoot the other weapon instead of even having to reload. So I think that's actually a great point rather than a negative point for combi weapons is because if I'm going to go out of action on two weapons, oh, that's that's a bad time anyway. That's like two, three turns down into like an intense firefight. I don't think I'd come out on top of that anyway if I was like shooting for a fourth turn in such a position that it mattered. Yeah, I'd go combi grenade launcher. I think it's, it's great and is my current thoughts at the moment. Combi Melter, I think it's a bit too dangerous, maybe a champ, but that is what I've got, and it's fun on my leader in my campaign at the moment. Damon then, I think just because of the layout of the books, goes through his heavy weapon choices. I don't really like heavy weapon choices on the leader. As I said, I like him moving about. So I'll get to the heavy weapon when we get to the road sergeant. And then completely agree on the dogs, 100%. Is they, they are overcosted and they need to be like 50 points, as you say. And they're just not worth taking. I took one in the campaign and it was just a, as I knew it would be, a 100 point handicap. Because they need that bit more punch. I think for 100 points, the Savage, the Loyal Protector rule is good. But they need to be more survivable so you can actually use that Loyal Protector rule. So, Road Sergeants, yeah, it's... I, I agree on most of the points with Damon. This is why I'm saying I'm doing a, re a reply to just pick up on the points I think we disagree on. Um, the main thing is, is heavy bolters versus stubbers. Now, I'm a bit controversial on this one. I don't like heavy bolters. I like the reliability of heavy stubbers. And the reason for this is, is that if I've got a skill and I've got a heavy stubber, I can reliably use that skill every single turn. Um, whereas if I've got a skill and I've got a heavy bolter, if I run out of ammo, I'm never reloading that so that champion's fully lost and that skill is fully lost. Whereas to me, all locks, and I should have said this at the start, shouldn't I? All locks are all not just the short range, mid range gang. 
they are the reliability gang. Can you do something and rely on it happening? And that to me is what they are. The auto guns, shotguns, the main weapons to me. Um, yes, bolters as well, but that's later in a campaign where you'll have more skills. So I pick the heavy stubber over the heavy bolter. And my heavy bolter would go somewhere else, being on the specialists. And that's because if a specialist runs out of ammo, it's only like 200 creds. If a champion runs out of ammo, it's that big drop during the game versus run out of ammo, reload, skills back into use, better ballistic skills back into use. And I find it does a lot of work anyway. It, it's got the amount of shots, you're averaging like four shots or four hits if you hit with it. And I know the heavy bolter does that, but I just like the stubber for its reliability. And I know that is such a different opinion than the majority of people. So then the, the arms, and I do think the heavy bolter is a great weapon. Other than that, if, you've playing, if you're gonna play Lucky Find as one of your cards, or you get into the realms of having munition here, steady hands, that sort of stuff, it comes back into the mix, but as a starting guide, I think start with the heavy stubber, maybe spec into heavy bolter when you've got, when you're like flowing in creds and you've already got the toolbox for the free reload, steady hands, munition here. So you've got like two free reloads with a, a re-roll on each of them for munition here. That's maybe when it's better having the heavy bolter. So arms master, but that's beyond the arm master scope. So I actually agree on Damon's loadouts of the Arms Master, a shotgun or a combat shotgun. And it's because of my view that Orlocks aren't this dominating close, co or can't be this dominating close combat gang. I think the Arc Hammer can work, but you've got to invest so many creds in it, crippling the flexibility of your gang to just in shout the Goliath that's shooting. Like you need to maximize that close range shooting to be able to edge out the other gangs at, at your close range shooting. Because a plasma gun works close up and so does a power axe. So I really need as many shotguns as possible. I really like the idea and I I actually did it in my campaign, but having Iron Stair on the Arms Master because he's the pointing guy, I fully agree with that one. Um, he's the only character with an undersuit, which is worth noting, especially if you want to get into combat. If you want to get into combat, recommendations are Master crafting on the Arc Hammer, a full servo harness as fast as you can buy it after starting, don't start with it. And then either mesh or carapace on starting with the armoured undersuit. Probably mesh armoured undersuit to start. Go up into the light carapace later, just to save those creds as I say, so you're not investing so much into this arms master. And get a dog whenever you're feeling stupid, like I did, and it didn't help that much. Wrecker, I, the only thing, he has a great review of all of these characters you see, so it's a bit out of the scope to repeat it. That this is already going to be like a half hour video. Wreckers, yeah, plus one hit, plus one strength, flail, definitely the best weapon for them. But is it? Because, I mean, two guns just look so cool. It's, it's worth mentioning that a wrecker with two guns just looks so good. And that's definitely what I tried to choose on my wreckers just because of that. So yeah, two wreckers, maybe a flail for backup, but modeled them with two guns because it just looks so good. Gunners, which are Orlok's gangers. What loadout do I go on my gunners? The bolter meta going like this, leaning heavily into that, I think is something I missed in this campaign. I've always managed to get by with shotguns. Um, and just, if you want to tool up, I think you're going to have to go bolters with Orlok's at the end. But I think shotguns start out really well for the gang. Strength four, damage two, but I think the, the minus one AP is really missed when you're staying with shotguns. The rapid fire dice is really missed. And that's not something that we disagree on with me and Damon. Flamers agree that it's suboptimal, but not only suboptimal, why would I not just take a combat shotgun and flame storm ammo? I've got a flamer right there and it's also got the utility of a shotgun. So yeah, it's, it's, it's a hard one for all locks. I mean, you want your cool flame model, but you don't manage to get it because it's a combat shotgun with a flame storm ammo. So yeah, my favorite is a, a shotgun. We agree on Sawn-Off shotgun 
it's cheap, it's strength three, scatter shot. I do actually think it's quite a good weapon. I disagree with, I, it might not be the optimal weapon, but I think we can all break Necromunda. You watching this video, you can go out and look at the book, break Necromunda. If this is the first time watching a Necromunda video, you've not yet picked up the House of Iron book, your first glance through, you can probably break Necromunda. Or maybe not with this book, but there's a few. Oh no, with this book, easy, yeah, yeah. So we'll, and we'll get on to that. So we're not always going for the absolute optimal choice, but sawn off shotguns, cool choice, fairly decent. Bolters, yes, I think they, I think they, what you should spec into after the first couple of games as people start getting that more armor. So Juves, this are Greenhorns, I suppose, but Juves just sounds so much better. Um, here is where I'd put sawn off shotguns. Definitely. I don't think anyone's ar Damon's arguing with that. Because gangers have access to better ranged weapons, I stick the, the Sawnoffs here. So the cool, the cool Sawnoffs go on the Jews, which are expendable anyway. It's quite a cheap weapon. And yeah, I, I also, I wouldn't start with a Greenhorn. I did in this campaign, but since then I've rolled Greenhorn on my settlement twice. And it's just, it's just a lot of Greenhorns already coming free your way. If I had which I did at the start of this campaign, like 40 credits left. Possibly I even should have gone, took dum-dums off something and gone a gunner with just a, sh um, a pistol to start because it's honestly greenhorns are just that bad, especially when you get them for free. It's or that bad for you to take as a bot thing. Cyber Mastiffs, 100% agree, 50 credits because um, the awesome power of Savage Bite isn't actually that awesome. Uh, and th this is my favorite, I'm gonna have to put that at the end, but this is my favorite gang, remember? Like, I know I'm being a bit down, like, am I being down on them? They're brilliant, all those are brilliant. Don't believe it, me if I've been negative up to now in this video. Bravado, um, I think challenge is actually such a, the, the challenge is such a terrible skill. Um, I don't think that can be said enough. Why would I spend an action to get you to shoot me when I can just shoot you and put you out of action. Don't think Damon's arguing that it's a great skill, but it's just, it can't be stated enough how bad that skill on the bravado tree is. The, the fact that he brings up steady hands with plentiful weapons, oh my God, I'd not thought of that. Yeah, it's, there's such a good little put together of plentiful weapons and steady hands. Um, I was always just thinking munitioner and steady hands, but steady hands plentiful. Yes, well done, Damon. Nice. So, Iron Hard in the legendary names, Damon gets a little bit wrong. It's if the character goes out of action, not if the character take, uses that skill. So, that actually makes a massive difference on, say, if you're going to use the Ridiculous Arms Master build to start with. Well, I don't care if my Ridiculous character goes out of action and that makes me auto break because I'm going to just choose to run anyway as soon as the Arms Master goes out of action. That's the massive difference that this makes. So if it's on your leader, if it's on your ridiculous character, it's not that much of a downside versus if you just took, used the skill and auto broke, that would make it near unplayable. Big man, I think, it, oh no, wait, no, it's big man is, I agree, it's not a good skill. It's not, sorry, it's not a good legendary name. What is it, the bubble of six inches? So big man, during a group activation, you include fighters within six. However, the fighter can't benefit by cover. So you're under the effects of a mono site. But then the mono site will stack with that. So heavy cover, if someone has a mono or an infra site, sorry, will do nothing. The only thing, time that I think this is getting close to worthwhile is in web gun meta where you need to stay outside the range of template, so that six inches helps a bit more. But I don't think that's a big enough benefit to be worth taking all the time. It's I just keep my guys within that three and it doesn't make my, that much of a difference, uh, especially when you can pre-measure. Next, we've got the lucky legendary name, and I think this is the best skill in the book, or the best legendary name. This is what makes all looks broken. Um, so how does it make them broken? Well, I can roll the dice like I would with one shot and then choose to make a dice a six. So one shot, you have to choose before the shot to auto hit. Lucky, 
I roll the dice and then decide I want it to be a six and a six always hits. So it, it covers me on that auto hit and also it covers me on any dice I roll. If he's going to go out of action and I've not used my auto hit yet, I'll use the six there. And, he, and you can put this, there's no limit to how many legendary names can be the same in a gang. So I think this is where it's broken. I really limit that or limit yourself doing that because it's, it is the best. Changing a dice to a six after you've rolled it is horrendously good. Iron Stare, that, that was come off Damon saying Iron Stare is the best in the group. I like Iron Stare. I've got it on my arms, Master. I think it's a cool leadership, legendary name, but definitely not the best in the group. Going down then further, Bullet Lord. I disagree on the Heavy Bolter just because of the reliability aspect. Auto going out of ammo on a Heavy Bolter that's never going to reload. Oh my God. Heavy stubber, reliably shooting so that in these multiple snappy engagements, like with a heavy weapon, can always be pushing it over to my edge, putting it my way in every engagement that you can see. Whereas with a heavy bolter, yeah, he might blow away someone, but I might need him in that next engagement. Improbable shot, which is number four on the improbable beatdowns. I actually really like this one. Um, you can put legendary names on your gangers and the downside, so basically what it is, is if you hit on a six, you get D3 experience, but you can only randomly generate skills. Gangers never get skills, but they can take this because everyone can take a legendary name. So they're gonna get the improbable shots just as often as anyone else, but also not have the negative of the random skills. And I think that's a real, good one for a ganger like he's, the other ones uh champion based or like obviously look he's good on every single person that can take it please don't do that i i want I, I want this book to be largely unchanged in the next iteration just added to so yeah he's a really good one on gangers take it on your gangers they'll level up faster next one headshot is if you kill someone on the first shot of the game um, you get d3 experience but your shots are always stray shots. Now this is incredible because it means that if you line up a shot, and this is all through the game, it's always a stray shot. If you line up a shot on someone and you miss, you hit the other person automatically. So it's it's really good for Gary. It's a, yet another guaranteed hit skill, essentially, but you've got to line it up. So it's it, that's less of a downside than you think. You just better not have one of your guys in the way. That's what the green farms are for, right? Oh God, I know I didn't say that properly, Jesus. It's early this morning, I got up before the, mid, the, the heat in Manchester in the middle of the day. Next, yet yeah, one shot. I think the downside of always having to take the action off shoot, if you can, is a big downside. It's not as, it's, they both auto hit skills, basically one shot on Lucky. Um, except lucky you can choose after you've rolled the dice so to pop that skill and I think that's obviously what makes lucky better obviously the downside's flavorful you'll be watching people six a lot so you don't have to take that skip that shot ever it could bite you in the ass on sneak attacks but I think it's it's a very good one hangers on I fully fully agree there's no real shockers in the hangers on yeah it's it just is what it is on the hangers on section. He covered it perfectly. Agreed on alliances. Um, I do want to go over one more thing that Damon actually missed entirely, I think, as I remember. I did make notes. Alliances, I think they add too much complication to the game that's already complicated enough. I think it's better to campaign complexity rather than adding alliances. I know some people think they're fun, but it's just not for me either. I think we agree on that. Finally, the Orlock terrain. And I think Damon missed this, but it's a big, there's a big boost to Orlocks in the Orlock terrain. And that's Son of Surprise. <laughs> no, he's not Son of Surprise. So being that little bit extra prepared, spending on this terrain, I think is really useful for Orlock. Son of Surprise, it, it's not great. It's not worth having a load of Son of Surprises. They're static on the map. Take a juve running around with the sawn off shotgun rather than a two shotgun surprises. Servitor sentry, I think, is absolutely terrible. I can take for the cost of a servo servitor sentry with an auto gun or las gun. I can take a ganger with a bolt gun 
and that, so I'll just do that, thanks. So where it actually comes into it is the Promethean barrels. They basically a three inch bubble um, around each marker where you can only make move simple actions, anyone. So it means you can control the avenues of approach of your opponent. And I think that's so useful for all locks. It's, it's a very unique thing that they can do there. It even trumps needle ways a little bit. Just thinking about it now from what Matt's doing in our campaign. It's, it's so good. I think it is abusable. Please don't abuse them because we all can see Promethean Barrels 30 creds in the book and take 10 of them. Please don't do that. Two, three barrels, I think, is a good use of them. It forces a full terms of movement over them, especially if you're in zone Metallis. Two barrels definitely guarantees that two turns. If you put them on the periphery of each other's zones, I think it's worthwhile like that. Do not put them next to an objective because you can just ruin the game. We all know, as I said before, Necromunda can be broken. Just please don't do it. Uh, the toolbox, I think it's really useful as well. It stacks with steady hands quite well, stacks with munition here quite well. It's a free reload for friendly fighters within one. So if you have a friendly fighter within one of, say, your heavy stubber champion and it's your heavy bolter ganger, they're both reloading for free at the start of their turn. If your champion's got munition here, they're both re-rolling that reload. It sort of makes the benefits, that combo makes the benefits of a champion transfer to the ganger. It's also, it's not too expensive. And then road relic, not used one yet, but the idea of having like a technical or some sort of trike or truck with um, the Orlock symbol on wrapped in chains with the heavy bolter, sorry, heavy stubber turret. Really cool, go out and do it. It's a good one, it's got enough rapid fire dice to be worthwhile. Apparently I love heavy stubbers. But yeah, that is my rundown of Orlocks in response to Daemons. How would I set up gangs to start? So I've, I've come up with four. I will give you my slightly revised um, setup that I started with at the start of this campaign. An all-up road captain with combi melter and one shot. As I said, I wouldn't take one shot again. I'd take the lucky one or something like that so my movement wasn't hampered. all -lock road sergeant with a grenade launcher and two pretty for primus. Grenade launchers are always solid. Um, it allows you to upgrade into the smoke grenade launcher. And he's just an all-round solid choice. Orlock Road Sergeant with Heavy Stubber and, yeah, Bullet Lord. Solid, I like the really easy reload. It's minus one AP, so although it's not brilliant, with two ammo dice, hopefully I can just plink off a couple of wounds. He can mow down the chaff while everyone else concentrates on the others. Arms Master, I started out with the shotgun. I then went into Executioner, Inferno ammo, and then he eventually got a Firestorm ammo combat shotgun. That setup had Nerves of Steel, Nerves of Steel, Nerves of Steel, and Munition Air, but I regret it as a, like, a power choice. It should have been Nerves of Steel, because it's being able to choose your own actions, not go pinned, is just so good. I then had a Wrecker. I changed it here to a single stub gun just to get the experience to start accumulating. I then swapped out a green horn for two gangers with auto guns instead of one ganger with an auto gun and a green horn with two stubs and one ganger with shotgun. And I just think that extra ganger is so much more worth it over a green horn. It's worth starting with a, a single stub gun rather than two stub guns with dum dum on the wrecker because uh, the green horn's just useless. I'm gonna go into like a more heavy, a more bolter, heavy bolter, slightly whacked up from their list. So road captain, combi weapon with grenade launcher just gives you the options like I talked about before of running into a room, gunning someone down and knocking them about. Road sergeant with heavy bolter, probably the lucky rule because I don't want him to start on sentry scenarios a lot of the time. All lock road sergeant with a bolt gun, solid choice. You're never going to go wrong with that. Nerves of steel on everyone, by the way. All lock arms master with combat shotgun. Solid choice, combat shotgun, he's not going to go wrong on that. And then the same wrecker with single stub gun, for the same reasons, it just gets them skilling up. You can expand them after the first game. And then I've got three gangers with shotgun, because like I said before on your gangers, shotguns at strength four, two damage, are really solid. Into, 
I'd consider this the real whack option for Orlox. Um, you could have some real fun playing with lighting effects for the for the the guns. So I've got a, a road captain with plasma gun because low power plasma guns are never going to overheat. So why not? Road sergeant with plasma gun because it's not going to go overheat. Why not? Like it's just better than a bolt gun. Sergeant with a plasma pistol stub gun with dum dums because I didn't like saying three plasma guns in a row. Um, an arms master with combat shotgun because he's, you're going to be sticking around for longer. And that left the creds for a wrecker with two stub guns, two gunners with shotguns, a gunner with auto gun, and then a prize fighter to start, just because this is the near min max list for an Orlock. So if you want the min max, that's my opinion. You're going to be competing more with the Van Sars at shooting. You're going to be able to take down the Goliaths without thinking about it as much with maximal fire. I think that's the way to go. So into the the final build which I think is the most fun. So it's the ridiculous arms master build. So you've got the Orlock Road Captain with a combi grenade launcher because that's my new jam. Orlock Arms Master with arc hammer, light carapace, armoured undersuit and a full servo harness. So he's going to be on a 3 plus. Um, he's going to be plus 2 strength, plus 1 toughness for the servo harness. He's not getting the movement decrease because of that, because it's a full. The arc hammer is going to knock people about. You're going to be strength eight, so you're going to be wounding Goliaths on twos. He's got a cyber mastiff, just because it's the ridiculous arms master build. But starting with that just keeps him around. Two gunners, one with auto gun, one with shotgun. It's just some cheap bods. And then two wreckers with st double stub gun, double dum dum. And they'll be flanking the arms master, make sure he doesn't go seriously injured. Just hopefully putting some pressure on somewhere else. And yet that's my build for Orlox. To be honest, I wasn't expecting this video to take as long as it has again, but go and check out Wellywood Wargaming if you just watched this for some reason without watching Wellywoods. He does a really good, concise job of explaining. I know it takes an hour, but that's how long mine was gonna take. So yeah, check out Wellywood, check out it not just for the Orlock guide, check it out for everything. Um, like, comment and subscribe to his page, do the same to mine. And if you really like the content, if you want to see an internet flame war go on, click my Patreon link, buy me a coffee, and we'll get an internet flame war going on with Damon's channel. Catch you in a bit.